Hi, um, th my name is Olivia Duffy. I'm a health educator for the CATCH program for Argus Community. Uh, CATCH stands for Community Action to Combat HIV and Hepatitis C. Uh, my role in that program is to provide HIV and Hepatitis C testing, as, long, as well as doing uh, group sessions and confidential sessions on sexual health, mental health, and tobacco cessation. So today um, I'm doing a tobacco webinar for you uh, regarding the tobacco usage among the LGBTQ community. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so next slide, please. So this is the overview and purpose of this webinar. It's to bring awareness of the harmful effects of smoking, uh, not just to an individual person, but to a specific demographic, which is the LGBTQ plus community. Next slide, please, Sean. Okay, so before we get into everything, I just want to define a few more terms. Um, the LGBTQ plus community is very inclusive. Uh, it includes um, individuals of all races, ethnicities, all ages, all socioeconomic groups, and from all parts of the United States. So that is something to be addressed. Um, the official term of the LGBTQ+, plus, because they do tend to add the plus, there are many um, groups in that in comprise of the LGBTQ+, plus. so therefore the full-fledged um, acronym, I should say, um, is LGBTQQIAAP. And of course, I'm going to explain that for you because it is, seems very long. Um, so it is the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally, and pansexual. So um, LGBTQ comprises of people of all different sexual orientations, um, a lot of gender fluidity as well. Um, I'm going to also explain some of the things that I just threw out at you. Um, so basically, lesbian is a woman or someone who presents as femme. Uh, it's a sexual attraction to other femme uh, individuals or women. Uh, bisexual is a sexual attraction to two or more genders. Uh, gay, uh, which is sexual attraction towards the same gender. That's usually towards um, male passing or um, man to man. Um, transgender is someone who, it's a, more of an umbrella term for gender identities and it differs from the gender that they were assigned to at birth. There are a lot of examples of that. So that can be uh, seen as a trans women, trans man, uh, gender queer, gender fluid, agender, bigender. Uh, though some people, it's also kind of seen on the non-binary spectrum, but some people who identify as non-binary or on the non-binary spectrum, don't feel comfortable identifying as trans. That's also something to note. Um, the Q, which is queer and questioning. A queer is again, uh, some also seen as an umbrella term um, for uh, used for same sex attraction as well, or how you identify if you don't feel comfortable with other um, other terms. Uh, questioning is someone who uh, is questioning their sexuality, uh, what they like and what they don't like. Um, also seen as like curious. Um, it's also a very, actually probably a larger group. Uh, I is intersex. So that is also another umbrella term for a variety of biological conditions in which a person is born with some sex characteristics that do not conform to either a, like a socially construct category of anatom anatomical sex. Sorry about that. Um, so they can have, you know, XX chromosomes and be very male pre presenting. Uh, that's an example of someone who is intersex. It's a very umbrella term and it's not exactly the same for every individual. Um, Another A is ace or asexuality, which means it doesn't uh, a person does not experience sexual attraction or desire to partner for the purposes of sexual stimulation to another individual. Um, another A ally, which is someone who you know sees himself as or labels them as straight, um, but is someone who is very supportive of the LGBTQ uh, plus community and supportive of their rights and will you know help them in any way and help engage the community. And P is 
pansexual. So pansexuality is the sexual attraction towards all genders or to people regardless of any type of gender. So that is something also that we could talk about as well. So those are what comprises it. Obviously there are other, um, other groups of individuals that comprise of the LGBTQ+. Um, so there, a lot of these terms are umbrella terms and uh, could relate to uh, some smaller subgroups, but um, this is how they, how it is their name. And um, a lot of people do go by the LGBTQ plus um, because it is quite long, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so according to Gallup and Williams Institute, um, approximately about 4.5% of the United States States adults, um, so people over the age of 18, identify in this group, um, usually LGBT. Um, some people obviously do not strictly go by either lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, um, but that's comprised of mostly about 14.65 million people in the United States who identify as LGBTQ+. Um, and this also includes people who identify as transgender individual. Uh, that's about 1.4 million people in the United States who consider themselves um, a transgender individu individual or a person of trans experience. Um, and millennials are also the most likely to identify as LGBT. Um, even though I would say probably now more so Gen Z are more likely than millennials to, um, you know, be ident uh, identify with the LGBTQ plus, um, you know, uh, there's a lot more social media out there. So they're more likely to identify um, as, um, you know, a, any type of queer, uh, bisexual, uh, lesbian, gay, they're more likely to be all also more open to uh, more less common labels or less common sexuality, such as uh, pansexuality, asexuality. So they're more likely to identify as such. Um, people of color are actually more likely than whites to identify uh, in the LGBTQ+. They said about 4% of whites uh, compared to 6.1% of Hispanic Latino people, 5% uh, of uh, black community, and 4.9% of Asian people. So that's something also to know. Uh, and like I mentioned before, it comprises of many, many races, ethnicities, and ages. Uh, Low-income people are actually are more likely to identify as LGBTQ+ than higher-income people, and that's about 6.2 percent of households making less than um, 36,000 annually versus 3.9 percent of households making more than 90,000. And that also shows by the CDC did a study in 2016 that 8 percent of high school students report being uh, either lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So that's 1.3 million people under the age of 18. But that was also in 2016 and that it could definitely be a lot higher. So next slide, please. So smoking rates uh, in the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, researchers have faced a number of challenges in understanding the health needs of the LGBT population. So uh, overall in the category of people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer adults, um, about 20.6% of adults in that category. And then there's 35.5% of individuals who identify as transgender, smoke cigarettes compared to 14.9% of people who identify as, as straight. Uh, transgender adults are 2.1 uh, times more likely than the cisgender adult to smoke. I should also say, because um, I am throwing out cisgender, cisgender is uh, someone who um, still goes by the gender that they were assigned to at birth. So that is also something to be aware about. Um, about only 11.8% of heterosexual young adults indicate that they currently smoke cigarettes compared to 19% of home, uh, people who identify as homosexual or gay, 16.9% of people who identify as bisexual, and 33.2% of transgender young adults. Bisexual women are up to 3.5 times more likely to smoke. Uh, they also are more likely to try their first cigarette at a younger age and have a higher nicotine dependence than straight women. Also, when I throw out bisexuality, uh, that is a dent also uh, puts people as well as men and women who are bisexual unless I state otherwise like I just did with the last uh, fact. 
um, LGBTQ plus smokers are significantly more likely to smoke menthol cigarettes. Um, more than 36% of uh, LGBT plus smokers report that they usually smoke menthols, which are easier to use, but harder to quit. And the prevalence of smoking other tobacco, other types of tobacco, including any type of water pipe, cigar, uh, cigarillos or small cigars is higher for adults who are identifying the LGBTQ plus community compared to uh, straight adults. So next slide, please. So uh, like I mentioned before, the definition of transgender is an umbrella term and it goes for many other gender identities. So don't go for gender queer, gender fluid, agender, bigender. Um, and some people who are on the non-binary spectrum could also uh, identify as transgender. A lot of you are like, what is non-binary? Uh, I sometimes throw out words like gender non-conforming or gender queer and non-binary. So it's basically a gender expression or identity that, that is outside or beyond the specific culture and society's gender expectations. And so this could be used as an umbrella term for those who either identi don't identify as either female or male. Um, and it's a relatively uh, term, it's a term that people are now becoming more aware of. So um, now that I got that and kind of cipher the definitions for you. Um, so there is actually very little information um, regarding people who are transgender um, and their smoking prevalence among this specific uh, population. It is reported though that cigarette smoking is higher in transgender individuals than among the general population of adults. Um, transgender population is actually extremely vulnerable because of, you know, there is a lot of high rates of sex, uh, substance use, uh, depression, a, um, HIV positive um, individuals, and social and employment discrimination. And these also are very much associated with higher smoking prevalence. Um, we have actually done a podcast on, you know, uh, transgender individuals. Um, and a lot, there's a very large population of them who are uh, who do go into sex work. So um, when we do talk about the transgender population, there is a lot of um, vulnerability there. Uh, you know, they are still very much discriminated against you in everyday employment um, or traditional jobs. Uh, there is still, you know, a big stigma against people who consider themselves transgender. Um, so there is a lot of vulnerability for, you know, um, health disparities, uh, you know, mental health uh, is at all time high, uh, substance use, their access to substance use is actually a lot easier accessible, uh, uh, especially when I also mentioned about sex work, um, they do are more likely or, you know, more at risk to get any, um, to contract an STI, sexually transmitted infection, or an HIV infection. So it is very, um, we should make note of that as well. This is a very vulnerable population. And so um, they're also, which goes into a lot of association with uh, higher prevalence of smoking, like I just mentioned. So that's something to also be aware about. Next slide, please. So this is from uh, the Truth Initiative, which is um, a very big uh, group on tobacco cessation and helping others quit smoking. Uh, so the LGBT uh, community is just importantly impacted by tobacco. Just like this mentions, it's about 20.6% of adults who consider, consider themselves um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual, 35.5% um, of people of trans experience, 14 compared to the 14.9% of straight adults. Uh, straight adults. And so uh, again, an LGBTQ adult is more likely, two times more likely to smoke than their straight peers. So there's something to very much, very much be aware of. And it also talks about Project SCUM, which I'm actually going to go into the next slide with. Next slide, please. So Big Tobacco and their target on the LGBTQ plus community. So Big Tobacco, we have talked about a lot uh, in our past webinars, um, you know, they do a lot of marketing to make sure everyone is smoking, you know, so they are still making their money. And they have very much uh, targeted the LGBTQ community since at least 1991. So they would advertise, companies would advertise in the gay press pub publications in early 1990s. They would often depict um, 
tobacco use as a normal part of the LGBT life. So many ads for products other than cigarettes were really glamorized smoking and many articles have nothing to do with smoking that were shown with tobacco images. And in about 1995, the tobacco company R.J. Reynolds, which is a, one of the oldest companies, uh, oldest tobacco companies in the United States, uh, they make a lot of money, <laughs> created a marketing strategy called Project Scum, which is what I mentioned before in the uh, picture that I uh, showed you. It's called Subculture Urban Marketing. That's what scum comes from. So it's basically to boost cigarette sales by targeting specifically uh, gay men and homeless individuals with ads and displays placed in communities and stores. On top of donations, giveaways, and increase in advertising, the tobacco industry made community outreach efforts such as hosting local promotions like LGBT bar nights and featuring specific cigarette brands. So they would go to LGBTQ bars and very much so make sure that it was known that they were giving out free cigarettes or free other tobacco products just so you know they can get that uh market that that specific demographic so they are more likely to go and buy more tobacco products from that said company and next slide please i'm going to show you one of the ads that they have specifically for the lgbt uh q this is um the brand camel so it's like take pride in your flavor so enjoy smoke free spit free drama free tobacco that's packed in a pouch uh, for great tasting long lasting any um any time enjoyment so this is the camel snus and camel snus is about um it's uh the tobacco product that you could actually put in your mouth so that there's no smoking in it. So they do typical uh, advertisements geared to a specific population, where they said take pride in your flavor it is obviously geared towards the LGBTQ plus community because of the pride and the colors that they are using. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are some of the health effects uh, that tobacco use do uh, that can affect the LGBTQ plus community. So specifically, um, gay men have high rates of HPV infection, which couples with tobacco use increasing their risk for anal and other cancers. So HPV, what is HPV? It's a human papilloma virus. Uh, the infection occurs when the virus enters your body. It can usually be through a cut, abrasion, or a small tear in your skin. Uh, it is transferred primarily uh, through skin and skin contact. So since it is through skin and skin contact, it's not an exchange of fluids. Uh, it can also be contracted from one partner. It can remain dormant and then later be unknowingly transmitted to another sexual partner, including a spouse. The reason why um, gay men do have higher rates is because of um, necessarily they're at more risk for any type of sexual activity. It's just there is actually no testing for individuals um, who are who identify as male uh the test that really is with um females who do go to the gynecologist and get tested so if you are someone who is straight and has a, a female partner you're more likely to know if you have hpv because of your partner so with a gay man who is predominantly uh only having sex with other men they would not know because none of them can have the proper test for it and this is also 80 million people are currently affected with some type of HPV. Uh, about 14 million Americans, including teens, become affected each year. And about 80% of everyone who in the population of the United States who has been sexually active before has had uh, or has HPV uh, sometime in their lifetime. And sexually active just means you've had sex at least once or was or is sexually active. Um, so, but HPV, oh, we haven't fully addressed that. HPV does cause uh, cervical and other cancers. There is a vaccine you could take, um, but for many people, people did not have the access to the vaccine because it only came out uh, in the early 2000s, I would say 2005. So, and like I mentioned before, it can remain dormant so you could live your life. Um, usually it goes away by itself, but there are so many strands of HPV that it tends to, lay dormant and, you know, kind of do some type of damage inside of you without you even knowing. Um, so if you are someone who has a high risk uh, HPV strand, uh, you are more likely to be at risk for other cancers. So this can be including the vulva, the vagina, the penis, or the anus. And it can also very much contribute to the back of the throat, including the base of the tongue and tonsils. So it's oropharyngeal cancer. And again, this could take 
years of some sort. Um, and not all the types of HPV can cause cancer. Um, but there is no way to know which people who have HPV will de develop cancer or other health problems. Um, but it, it does have some type of issue if you do have HPV. Um, it does not necessarily weaken your immune system, but if you have other pre-existing conditions, it can make it a lot worse. So people who already have weak immune systems, so this also includes people who are HIV uh, or AIDS positive, you're more likely to you're less likely to be able to fight it off. And also with smoking, smoking does cause a weak immune system. So that already has two negatives and it could completely weaken your immune system. Um, your body will not be able to fight off HPV as much as it should with, that, uh, with your weak immune system. So you're more likely to develop more health problems. Now, 30% of throat cancers are caused by HPV. So when you do add on smoking or, you know, like I uh, mentioned before with anal cancer, uh, you're increasing your risk of, of uh, getting cancer in the, in the anus or your throat when you have HPV as well as continuously smoking. So that's something what I mentioned before, very much to be aware about. So uh, going to the next fact, LGBT individuals often has risk often have risk factors for smoking that include daily stress related to prejudice and stigma, stigma that they may face. So there is a lot of oppression with um, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, there is, it's still a lot of systematic enforcement to prevent specific groups of people to have equal opportunities. So there still is a lot of uh, cis sexism, uh, like I mentioned before with cisgender and transgender. There, This is a specific form of sexism. Um, which is a way of thought that only cisgender people are seen as normal or right. Um, not only is that um, still seen as, you know, a big oppression in the United States, it's also seen within the group of LGBTQ plus uh, members. Not so much, it's not very a big worldly view of it, but there still are people who um, do not see uh, transgender individuals as right, which is completely wrong. Uh, you know, every human deserves deserves to live and deserves to have the same equal opportunities as one another. There's still a, a big type of heteronormativity, uh, the belief that people fall into distinct and complementary genders. So with natural roles in life. So there are still that um, type of stigma with there you have to be either a man or a woman in this world. Um, and there's heterosexism, which is a system of attitudes, bias, and discrimination in favor of opposite sex, sexuality, and relationships. So there still is a lot of discrimination towards people in the LGBTQ community for who they love and who they are, um, which is detrimental. Like I mentioned before, we are all individuals who deserve all the same equal opportunities to live our lives. Um, and the fact that you know, certain individuals are being kicked out of their homes, having to move to sta uh, certain states or areas where they think they could be able to make a living, um, you know, be kind of do things they need in order to survive. Uh, like I mentioned before, with transgender individuals, uh, there's a very big, um, very big population of them who do go into sex work uh, because of the discrimination and regular employment. So there's still a lot of things that, you know, keep them at a high risk for health disparities and um, kind of the tobacco industry really puts them in a box and, you know, makes it even worse for them uh, health-wise. There's still a lot of macro aggressions, you know, institutional discrimination towards these specific groups of people. Then there's the small micro aggressions, you know, the everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental snubs, insults, or slights. Uh, which could be intentional or unintentional, but it makes, you know, microaggressions continuously add up and make macroaggressions. So the LGBTQ individuals do have higher risks for smoking. They're dealing with a lot of um, men mental health concerns and a lot of the stigma that I just relayed to you is still very prevalent in the United States in 2020. And there's still a lot of phobias, uh, you know, homophobia, biphobia, phobia, lesbophobia, transphobia, there's still a lot of these phobias in the United States. So it, it does add up and, you know, it relays in a lot of other ways. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, there's higher risks for them to um, use, uh, use tobacco products and a higher risk for them to, you know, more likely to have uh, worse health effects uh, without 
not only that, just access to treatment and how they are, you know, more, more likely not to go to a doctor, especially transgender individuals, because they don't want to um, go through all of this with a doctor and try to tell them what's going on with their body and when they see them as uh, another gender. So this is something to also be aware about um, with the, this population. Another one I was saying was bartenders and servers in these nightclubs are exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke. With a lot of people, if you're going to a club, you're not going every single night. So um, your risk is a lot less of a risk compared to bartenders and servers who are there every single night making a living, being exposed to this smoke and uh, the tobacco. So they're more likely to be exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke and more likely to get um, other health effects from it, such as uh, lung cancer, secondhand smoke lung cancer. And among women, uh, secondhand smoke exposure is more common among non-smoking lesbian women than among non-smoking straight women. <coughs> Excuse me. Like I mentioned before, you're more likely to be exposed to it, um, you know, especially with the nightclubs and bars that are LGBTQ plus friendly because they are the tobacco companies are letting them, they're giving the advertisements and um, giving out free giveaways to them. Another one I mentioned bef uh, briefly with my HPV uh, infection fact about the HIV positive community. Um, smoking is the leading cause of death in those who are HIV positive, have the virus under control. In fact, HIV today shortens life by an average of five years, even though right now we have a lot of treatment for people who are HIV positive. You can live a long and ha healthy life um, with the tr if you are on treatment, um, because um, if HIV does go untre untreated, it does you know weaken your immune system and progress into um, AIDS, and can progress into you know you're more likely because I said before it's a weak immune system. You're more likely to contract you know pneumonia or other things and unfortunately die. So this is something to be aware about. Um, smoking, though, when you have HIV, you're also more uh, less more likely to get other serious illnesses than non-smokers, um, which I mentioned with uh, pneumonia. But there are other ones specifically geared uh, with smoking and HIV. So this is COPD, which is chronic obstruction obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a serious lung disease that causes severe breathing problems and includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. You are more likely if you smoke and are also HIV positive um, to have any type of heart disease or more likely to have a stroke. Uh, lung cancer, head and neck cancer, cervical cancers, and anal cancers are more likely when you have uh, when you smoke and are HIV positive. And like I mentioned before, with anal cancer and cervical cancer, that could also relate to HPV as well. So next, next slide. Okay. Um, like I mentioned before with one of my facts, uh, the risk factors, causes of this disparity may include both psychological and environmental risk factors. Um, you know, LG, the individuals in the LGBTQ plus community experience risk factors like internalized homophobia, stress to societal stigma, and negative reactions to the disclosure of sexual orientation or coming out that may contribute to an increased smoking rate. Um, I just mentioned this before. It is very much so uh, still seen again, with homophobia, internalized stigma about the LGBTQ plus community, that they're more likely to, you know, have some type of stress relief with smoking or and develop bad habits um, to make people feel better. And the LGBTQ youth, as much as 26% of uh, school-aged uh, people who identify as gay, lesbian, and bisexual are more likely to smoke cigarettes or cigars or even use smokeless tobacco compared to 18% of people who don't identify as lesbian, gay, straight, or part of the LGBTQ plus community. Something very much to note. That's the next slide, please. So uh, I did mention before it is, you know, you know, as an individual who's in the LGBTQ plus community, you're more likely to start smoking. Uh, but with these individuals, you're five times more likely than others to never intend to call a smoking cessation hotline. Um, there's a lot of factors with that. Um, with the LGBTQ plus individuals, you're less likely to have health insurance than straight individuals. I mentioned that before about there's a lot of discrimination um, with healthcare compared uh, to the H, um, people who are in the LGBTQ 
LGBTQ plus community. Um, like I said, some people are out on the streets, you're more likely to be, um, you know, homeless, uh, move around from time to time, more likely um, to face a lot of discrimination in employment um, settings. So you're not likely to have consistent health insurance uh, and you're less likely to call up a smoking cessation quit line um, in fear of a discri discrimination for you to want to quit. Um, the gay, gay, bisexual, and transgender men are 20% less likely than straight men to be aware of smoking quit lines, despite individuals having been exposed to tobacco cessation advertising similar to straight individuals' exposure. So they're less likely to actually even be aware that there are smoking quit lines despite that, um, which is very interesting to note be probably because there's been so much um, propaganda for them to smoke that they aren't even aware of the quit, um, quit lines that, you know, would help them um, provide a tobacco cessation resource for them. That's something to note. Next slide. So with all of them, there is still a lot of access to tobacco cessation. So there is, there should be more of an effort to the LGBTQ plus community uh, to help them, um, to help them, you know, quit and, be able to live their life a lot longer and you know focus on their health. Uh, some of the best defenses for quitting smoking is to first off not start. Um, cigarettes are very addictive and they avoid the temptation to start is well worth it. So please encourage your family and friends not to start. There are very much circles um, you know, the LGBTQ plus do you see other individuals as a family. It's a very tight knit uh, community with your friends and family. If you are someone who doesn't start, you could still be aware of the harmful um, harmful effects of smoking and you could be there for your friends or family, uh, you know, to educate them on uh, how smoking is addictive and how it could uh, do, do damage to your body. If you are someone who does smoke, you know, the best defense really is to quit on your own time, obviously, because um, you're not going to quit unless you want to. You really can't do it for anyone but yourself. Uh, it takes an average smoker five to seven tries before actually stopping successfully. Um, so you really can't give up on it. You really have to remember that you're doing it for yourself, for your own health. Um, and that's the best way, because if you do something for someone else, um, it doesn't go as well as you think it would be. You really have to make the decision to quit. Um, and on your own time, you know, because you have to fully process it. And if you don't think you're ready to quit yet, you don't have to, but just keep it in the back of your mind and still have the resources. Um, protect yourself. Like I mentioned before, secondhand smoking, which I brought up quite often, especially with uh, people who work in the nightclubs or, you know, are around people who do smoke. It's extremely toxic. It's toxic, so you can't tolerate it. You have to speak up and advocate for smoke-free bars, restaurants, clubs, and workplaces, because um, secondhand smoke can still do a lot of damage, uh, even if you're not the one smoking. Uh, so that's important to know. We are in a very big environment, um, especially in New York City. Uh, there is a lot of pollution, a lot of closeness. Um, so it is important to not tolerate smoking uh, or pe being around people who do smoke. Next slide, please. If you do stop smoking, you're going to notice a difference after, you know, months, years, and even minutes. So after 20 minutes, your heart rate and blood pressure actually drop because smoking does increase your blood pressure. About 12 hours after you stop smoking, the carbon monoxide level in your blood uh, drops to normal. If uh, you stop smoking uh, between the two weeks to three min weeks af months after you stop, your circulation improves, your lung function increases. Um, after uh, one month to nine months of stopping smoke, uh, when you stop smoking, uh, your coughness, uh, coughing and your shortness of breath really decrease. The tiny hair-like structures that move mucus out of the lungs, which is the cilia, they start to regain your nor the normal function in your lungs. You increase the ability to handle mucus, clean the lungs, and reduce the risk of any infection. So like I mentioned with the increased risk of infection, smoking does weaken your immune system. When you do stop smoking, you help build it up again. So that also helps with fighting off other infections. After one year of you stopping smoke, the excess risk of coronary heart disease is half that of, 
of continuing smokers, so just one year after you smoke. Five years after, your risks of cancer of the mouth, throat, esophagus, and bladder are cut in half. Cervical cancer risks fall to that of a non-smoker after only five years, and stroke risk can fall to that of a non-smoker after two to five years. After 10 years of you stopping, uh, when you stop smoking, your risk of dying from lung cancer is about a half that of a person who is still smoking. The risk of cancer of the larynx and pancreas disease uh, decrease. And 15 years after you stop smoking, your risk of coronary heart disease mm -hmm. is equal to that of a non-smoker. So I think when we are individuals, when we say that we're continued smokers, we're always smoking, you really don't see uh, the benefits of stopping smoking because you think once you've already done it, uh, all hope is lost which is not true. We're consistently growing as individuals and so are our bodies. So um, you could still stop and you will still see greater risks of living a healthy life when you stop now uh, instead of later. Uh, so that is always something to mention with all these facts. Um, even 15 years after you stop smoking, there's still a lot of benefits to it. And even like I mentioned from 20 minutes to 15 years, which is actually amazing. Next slide, please. Um, do you need help quitting? Like I mentioned before about tobacco cessation resources, we do have a lot. We do provide a lot. These are a few of them. But if you are someone who is looking to quit smoking, uh, you could always contact us on our YouTube, our any of our social media platforms, our email that will bring up in the later um, slide. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to thank you all for um, coming to our webinar today. That's, um, it's amazing to see, um, not necessarily amazing, it's more interesting to see the uh, risks that a specific uh, group of people do have compared to uh, others in uh, tobacco use. Um, and I want to talk more about our team at Argus Catch. Like I mentioned, it's Community Action to Combat HIV and Hepatitis C. And we are in New York City. Uh, we provide HIV H, uh, and HCV, which is hepatitis C, pre and post test counseling. We have a wonderful Christopher Olin, who's a behavioral health coordinator, and he provides Government Performance and Results Act, which is a GIBRA. Uh, we connect clients to any type of medical services, uh, and specifically uh, HIV and hepatitis C, but we provide other ones as well. We can connect clients to substance use services, including smoking cessation, like I mentioned before. We can connect clients to any type of mental health service that um, they want and connect clients to local food pantries if they're in uh, food insecurity. And we can assist uninsured individuals to get access to medical insurance. Next slide, please. Um, I want to show our team. So like I mentioned before, hi, my name is Olivia Duffy. I'm a health educator. Um, as along with my uh, coworker, Yumina Castillo, health educator, we provide the tobacco cessation webinars uh, every Tuesday at two and every Tuesday at six. Um, I men mentioned Christopher Olin in the slide before. Uh, he's our behavioral health co coordinator, so he could really provide the GIPRA um, and connect you to specific medical services, specific food pantries, and so on and so forth. And um, our lovely Sean Belgrave, who's our technical coordinator, uh, who helps with every one of our webinars and everything we do online. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Um, so next slide, please. I just want to provide another thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, you make sure to at, go to our email, which is argusketch at gmail.com. Our number is 929-322-4106. You could also see us on the arguscommunity.org website where you find us under the Catch program and also EIS, which is Early Intervention Services. Uh, you can, and you can follow us on social media. We are Argus Catch on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and our YouTube as you're seeing this on. And we do have a link tree. We do have a lot of webinars, uh, including not just our tobacco station ones, but we do have a sexual health one, which is every Wednesday at 2 p.m. So be sure to check that out as well. Next slide, please. And thank you so much for joining us and you could join us next week. Uh, again, like I mentioned, it's two to six, two and six. So uh, if you miss one session, you can come to the next one or you can catch us on our YouTube page if you miss any of our webinars. Um, and we do have our webinar 
Wednesday at two for sexual health. And our next one is STI 101. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again. Bye.